for courses exploring the foundation of modern philosophy, as well as live events bringing philosophy to life. Visit philosophyportal.online and become a member today. Throughout 2024, our members get access to four monthly events. In February, we focus on the concept of communism and welcome guests Carl Hayden Smith, David McCarricker, and Alex Ebert. Find out more at philosophyportal.online. Welcome to another Philosophical Conversation. My name is Kira Last, and I'm really excited to be joined again by Dr. Samuel McCormick. For those of you who follow the channel, you'll know that, that Samuel McCormick and I had a discussion only about four or five months ago titled Reading Lacan's Cree, and that was in preparation for the upcoming course at Philosophy Portal at the time focused on Lacan's Cree. I am filled with a, a mixture of, of joy and, I suppose, mourning uh, that that course has now completed. Um, it ended last month in December. And so I had spent the entire fall deep into the Acree, teaching the Acree, discussing the Acree with many interesting thinkers. And I thought it would be a really interesting idea to bring Samuel back on and have another chance to discuss the Acree from the other side, so to speak, of teaching the Acree. So welcome back, Samuel. Great to have you here. And uh, maybe just opening with a, what was your sort of impression of where we left off with the last conversation there? Well, it's great to be back. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, our last conversation, I had COVID, bro. So I was I was out. <laughs> I barely remember the thing, but I did watch it afterwards. And uh, one of the things I felt good about from that conversation is being sick and down and out and and a little feverish. I, I think that's a, a great place to be. I remember hearing from a, an old friend that uh, he enjoyed reading Lacan best when he was drunk. And mm. I've tried that and that doesn't work too well for me. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. I'll touch on a point and then other times I just miss whole swaths of things. But being sick and reading Lacan with some sort of a feverish thing, something that kind of just heats the temperature of your brain a little bit, that is seems to be, you know, fairly productive. Hung over reading Lacan, that's productive because you're so slow that, I mean, depending on how hung over you are. But I think being in altered states with Lacan makes a lot of sense. And that's what I remember from our last call was just feeling like I was kind of in a slightly altered state. Um, but I really enjoyed it. I was really honored that you asked me to come on and talk about this book. Um, the other thing that struck me about uh, our call last time was I was deeply reminded of the fact that this book is a mid-1960s culmination. And you know how Lacan thinks is kind of how we think too in, in a lot of these situations where we look back on what has happened in hindsight and come to some sort of a realization that was there from the start, but wasn't realized as such. And looking back now that lectures on Lacan is into the early 1970s Lacan, so our new series on seminar 19 begins really soon. And that's about three, four seminars after Ikri. So it, it's interesting to see where Lacan goes after Ikri here. And then we've got this volume, Other Ikri, which will soon be translated and will soon have a commentary uh, volume attached to it, which has tons of great stuff from the later Lacan. So I think it'd be really cool once the English translation of Other Ikri is out. What a great opportunity for Philosophy Portal to kind of continue and extend into Lacan's later thought. So in hindsight, I also look at our conversation about Ikri as a conversation about a time capsule in Lacan's thought. It really captures what Lacan is up to in what you might call like the middle period of his thought. So those are a couple of things that stuck with me. That's fantastic. And I had no idea about this other Ikri, which uh, has yet to be properly translated into English. I mean, and that is really nicely situated here with the goals of philosophy portal, because the way I opened up the Ikri um, in, in the course was I, I actually referenced something you said to me in our reading Lacan's Creek conversation last time about 
the way that Akri opens up into the later Lacan and specifically focused on this um, relationship between knowledge and truth, of course, with science and truth being sort of the final um, paper in the Akri and just really opening up here to getting into the the later Lacan and his, his focus on truth. Um, yeah. And, and I, I actually used your suggestion for going into the later Lacan to complement and in some sense, I think, extend some of Slavoj Žižek's recommendations for reading Lacan, because in his book, How to Read Lacan, he says that we should go back and forth between the Akri and the seminars, that you don't understand the Akri unless you complement it with the seminars, and you don't understand the seminars unless you complement it with the Akri. But yeah. then sort of the big problem arises when you come to the later Lacan, because there's no corresponding Akri for the later seminars. So I think that what you were pointing towards there with the later seminars and how to approach the later seminars coming out of the Akri was really instructive. But now that we have potentially the other Akri coming out, which are sort of reflective of more the later Lacan, perhaps we can again extend that sort of capacity to bounce the seminars and the Akri off of each other and sort of see the Lacan of the clinic and the Lacan of the philosopher sort of in a in a deeper light. And I think maybe before we get into any specific passages on the Akri, I'd like to get your perspective on both the relationship between Lacan of the clinic and Lacan as a philosopher, and also the appearance in our contemporary horizon of sort of Lacanians who follow more of a clinical direction and are interested in clinical work, and Lacanians who are more philosophical and are interested in the philosophical implications of Lacan. Do you think that there's a need for a higher order dialogue between these two orientations? How do you understand the relationship between these two orientations? <clears throat> well, this is something I learn every other Friday when in the discussions at lectures on Lacan, we see an influx of clinicians and an influx of, I wouldn't call them philosophers, but theorists. The later Lacan is seems to me very keen to point out the difference between what he sees as philosophy, as a love of wisdom, and theoria, which is a love of truth. And he sees those two as very distinct, and he sees the psychoanalytic theorist more on the side of theory in the sense that they love truth. And I think what he sees with philosophy is an attempt to save truth this commitment to wisdom as an effort to like rescue truth from the den of society. And I think that what, what Lacan is up to as a theorist is something more akin to loving truth, which also means to love weakness, because the dilemma of truth in Lacan, and it's a dilemma that I think emerges in the early part of his later thought, and if Colette Soler is right, kind of fades away in his, in his ultimate uh, final thinkings. But the dilemma of truth is that it always has two sides. There's a side that can be said and a part that can't be said. And what the part that can be said always says again and again and again is, there's this other part to me, this other part that I can't say. And so you see this very well illustrated in classic examples of love, faith, scientific discovery, artistic breakthrough. The love letter is a good example where somebody shows up and says, words fail as I try and describe just how much I love you. Let me tell you what it means to be faithful. To be a knight of faith is to always be up against the limit of one's ability to explain to somebody else what it means to have faith. Similar with love. Love and faith are two sides of human experience that just defy expression. And part of the reason why is that they're always touching on and tinged with a realm that is infra-symbolic. It doesn't lend itself to easy articulation. And for Lacan, that's what the truth ultimately is. There's a part of it that can be said and a part that can't be said. And the part that can be said always says just that. There are these two sides to me, one that can't be expressed. And the question Lacan has is, what would it mean to love this impotentiality, this incapacity, this inability to speak the full truth? And he says, well, this would be a love of weakness. And that, in the end analysis, translates into a love of castration. So when you have theorists that show up 
with this love of castration, this embrace of weakness, this love of truth that always keeps them in a state of learned ignorance, as Lacan puts it in the early 1970s. And you have that with clinicians who have really embraced Lacan's clinical insight that this is something to be transmitted to the analyzand, that part of the clinical experience is to take the analyst's knowledge of truth as weakness, as castration, as limit, and to inculcate in the analyzand a love of these limitations, a love of castration. And in my experience working with clinicians and theorists, when those two forces come together, the clinicians with the psychoanalytic act under their belt and the theorists with the math theme somewhere else in their pants, when those two come together, you just have this amazing confluence of things. And again, I think that's exactly what makes psychoanalytic theory so unique because you have this thing called the psychoanalytic act called analysis. And I look at the background of our your, your screen there, and it's a vivid reminder that there is this space of analytic experience that you just don't see anywhere else. Like Wittgenstein doesn't have an analytic act. He's an anti-philosopher, but he doesn't have this space where you go out and do Wittgensteinian stuff with other people. You know what I'm saying? Like you can... I've been in Wittgenstein reading groups and had a great time, but that's not the same as analytic experience. So I think the secret to really unlocking Lacan is to take all the theory boys and girls who just want to run the philosophical literary implications and dump them and take all the clinical nosebleed folks who typically veer away from Lacan on account of complexity and dump them as well. I think the best community for understanding Lacan is one where you have folks that are both and around theory and analytic experience. And that's precisely what we do in lectures on Lacan. It's usually a mix of established and established clinicians and trainees, and then professors, scholars, whatever, um, and learners of every stripe, undergraduate students, a lot of graduate students, um, a lot of folks who are graduate students moving towards a clinical practice. That's kind of one of the sweet spots in the work that we do is you have people that are reading Lacan coming out of university education, but on this pathway towards the clinic. And so when we've got these established clinicians from all over the world who are very open-minded and warm, and then some theorists in the mix as well from whatever um, uh, university position they hold. Mixing it up, I think it really benefits this, this really interesting group of folks who are coming out of university experience, perhaps with an undergrad or a master's degree, and then marching their way towards a clinical practice, whether they are just getting started um, or whether they're um, anticipating this further down the line. It really helps do the work that I think Lacan is doing. He never shied away from the fact that when he was teaching, in other words, during the seminars, he was speaking to clinicians. And usually in a derisive way, which I don't entirely appreciate, but when he steps up to the mic, he thinks to himself, okay, this is part of what it means for me to train Lacanian clinicians. And so I think it's interesting as a teacher, he never wavered from addressing clinicians to be. But I think as a reader of Lacan, I find it much more useful, to your question, to have theorists and clinicians in the mix as an audience. I love that. I think it's a really valuable. And I experienced that actually in teaching the course, because thankfully we had uh, a number of students who were interested and influenced by both backgrounds. And there was there was kind of a, a nice a nice sort of overlap and overlay between those, those different approaches, even if sort of my approach might lend itself more to the, to the theoretical or the, or, or the philosophical and more than others. And yeah. I, I love, I love that you're, well, one, I think, I don't know if you invented this word, but I, or maybe it's just derived from Lacan, but this idea of impotentiality is a fantastic word. I think that I thought you might like that. Yeah. 
it was that's a that's a beautiful word and and also your emphasis on the love of weakness and the love of castration this comes out so clearly i think you pointed me towards this in our last conversation that one of the i think you said the paper that you would you would recover if all of the lacanian papers were erased would be um the subject and the and the dialectic of desire big time yeah i still think that for the, me is the centerpiece it's a major right it's a major sort of um a sort of a major statement by lacan in terms of what he's aiming at and you know that that statement he says about the end that you know uh what, about what castration means that yeah. castration means that we have to uh refuse jouissance in order to attain jouissance on the ladder on the inverse scale of the ladder of desire Bingo. you know i think yeah this is sort of this sort of like says it all kind of thing and it, and it really yeah. it really really sort of um you know it, if you understand the, that in the context of the graphs of desire that he's developing then that takes it to another level um yeah, that's exactly what it does it takes it to another level another yeah. level in the graph of desire that's exactly what that statement that's such key statement that you pull out really brilliantly that's what it does it takes you to the upper level of yeah. the graph of desire exactly yeah so yeah yeah so that so that's that's sort of a nice centerpiece and what what where where lacan's going towards the end of the decree i just want to link this love of weakness this love of castration this impotentiality actually with the beginning of the decree with something that I think is a shocking statement, something of a shocking reflection that I, I'm not sure how much it's picked up or how much it's reflected upon, but I do think it has influenced, for example, the Slovenian school with notions of the inhuman. It's that Lacan says in the overture to this collection, he says, man is an unsure, man has become an unsure reference point. I think that this is a really remarkable statement. I think he's ultimately here trying to open us up to the L schema uh, and and the other. Um, mm. But th this idea that man is an unsure reference point, I think this is interesting. Maybe we could talk about this in relationship to what you're emphasizing with the love of castration, the love of weakness, the love of impotentiality, because it's almost like we have to love something that's the weakest about man. That's that it's something like a something like, you know, what the power in Lacan is that what unifies us all is that we are all born into this world as a fragile, impotent body. And that lack is something we all share. And the, and maybe there's a power in that. There's a power in not not um not interacting with each other on the level of um, you know, uh I guess the the normative ego ideal of the human being, but rather as a being that is um, trying to love weakness, trying to love castration, trying to love what is most impotent about um, ourselves. So I just want to ask you what 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 are your thoughts about this um, this idea that man has become an unsure reference point, and do you see it as in any way connected to what I'm pointing towards here? Mm -hmm. I don't know the, the passage that you're talking about, and it would really depend on what he's meaning here by man. So I think that lo logically speaking, it's tempting to think that what Lacan starts doing with logic as he edges towards the math theme and some of his later thought, and forgive me, that's just kind of where my thinking is right now, um, is, is dependent on what Frege and some other folks were doing in symbolic logic. I don't think so. I think that the the chip on Lacan's logical shoulder, if you will, is Aristotle. I think that Lacan always saw himself as doing something akin to and on par with what Aristotle was doing with early logics of the all, of the none, and of the some. And I think that part of what he's up to there around all men is an early start towards what he would eventually do with all men except one mythical man. So there you have his formulations for masculine sexuation. All men are castrated. And if this totalizing set of all men is to hold, there has to be one man who is not man excluded from that category. If everything is packed in the car, it means nothing has been left out. 
Nothing for Lacan is something to be studied. Here, the nothing in question is the mythical father of the primal horde, who's not castrated. It's this narrative that heteronormative men tell themselves again and again, is that if I just do X or I just do Y, I could rise to the level of the father of the mythical horde, who takes what he wants, who enjoys all the women. He's just an uncut daddy dick wandering through the field of sexuality. That's the fantasy that heteronormative masculinity often has. All of us are castrated. Ah, and for that very reason, we have this external individual known as the mythical father. So I think Lacan is messing with this all men are whenever he writes man. In other words, what I'm suggesting here is without looking at that passage carefully, what he might be doing, perhaps even in spite of himself, is calling out the totalizing set known as man or mankind in order to anticipate some more nuanced thinking around all men, some men, no men, which hasn't even brought us to woman, which is a totally different formulation. But this is some stuff that Lacan's going to get into in the next, you know, like five or six years after the Acree is published. So I can't speak to that individual passage, but I can speak to your reading of it and your, your intuition that somehow this instability in the individual subject is something that that would need to be loved, cherished, and, and, and realized as an incapacity that's been with us since birth. And I think that's terribly important. It's important theoretically and clinically because it puts us on the path that leads to what I believe to be the horizon of analytic theory and technique, which is a familiarity with death. Reading Lacan is about learning how to die. Going to analysis, completing an analysis, is about becoming familiar with death. And what I see in what he's doing with weakness and impotentiality, which by the way is also an Aristotelian term, it's from the Greek adynamia, which was the counterpart for Aristotle to dynamis, which is potentiality. So you've got in Aristotle, you've got several different modalities. The crucial ones are the necessary, the actual, the contingent, but also the possible or the potential. And what Aristotle was really smart to realize is that to have a capacity, a potentiality, is also to preserve its impotentiality. And I realize I'm kind of ping-ponging around here, but this is, again, the kind of fever state that I think it takes to really make sense of how Lacan works. For Aristotle, having the ability to play the piano, preserving that ability, which is to say, not allowing the ability to play the piano to become the act of playing the piano. You see, potentiality can always pass into actuality. I have the capacity to write but I am not writing right now. And so in this state of potentiality where I have the ability to write, but I'm not writing, I also preserve an impotentiality, an ability not to write. And this was Aristotle's insight into how that weird modality of the possible worked. For something, and I noticed my blurring here of the possible and the potential here, but that term comes right from Aristotle. It's linked up with a lot of his logical work. For Lacan, though, it culminates in an insight into what it means to love oneself and to love others. And it's not an unchristian insight either, by the way. The powerlessness that you were just describing that might be a source of strength sounds a lot like some shit that Paul of Tarsus used to talk about, used to write about in letters to various cities around the Mediterranean. So I think there's a lot of resonance in the insight that you bring out around man no longer becoming, being the kind of like a centerpiece or a stable, reliable, et cetera. And it centers on breakdown, incapacity, and an incapacity that's not to be squashed and removed, but cherished and held. And this is what Lacan means 
in his definition of love. And there is no other definition of love in Lacan. And I want to be adamant about this because so much shit gets talked about Lacan on love. There's really only one definition of love in Lacan in an authentic sense, if you will. And that is giving what one doesn't have to someone else. And what we don't have, we lack. So what you're doing is you're accepting the lack in the other and also accepting the fact that you are lacking, incomplete. And I think once those two things come together, you have a theory of love that's not emphasizing completion of one or the other being, but instead a theory of love that about two incomplete beings coming together and hopefully in a way where their rough edges don't rough each other's rough edges up. You see, that's the other thing too, is living in a state of love in the Lacanian sense is living in a state of self-compassion because you accept that you are unable at some level, impotential at some level, incapable at some level of knowing everything about yourself. There's the unconscious. There's the truth of human subjectivity, that there is this field of ignorance that is with us always in the level of the unconscious, but also that you're able to love about other people this very same thing. They don't know themselves either. There are things that I love in my partner that they can't understand about themselves. And there are things that they love in me that I can't see either. So you get some of this in early Lacan's thinking, but I think it's only later, starting in seminar 17, around page 52 or so, that you have this great robust theory of love as a love of weakness. And so I think that if you want to be, be coy with the passage that you're referring to, which again, I don't, I don't recall this passage off, offhand, um, I think one way to work it is to say that Lacan is setting the stage for a theory of human subjectivity that is not premised on strength, completion, consistency, wholeness with another, love in this Aristophanes sense of completion, but instead, instead one in which you, you learn to live with the fact that you're limited. You learn to live with the truth of castration. And, you know, I wonder if Lacan is trending in the direction in his later thought of also saying that um, at some point you give up on trying to understand all that. In the early 70s, Lacan says understanding is fundamentally an obscurity. Anytime someone has an answer or a meaning of something, rest assured you're in the field of obscurity. I wonder, though, if there's a point in reading Lacan and thinking with Lacan in undergoing a Lacanian analysis where you just stop getting off on the deciphering of errors, of parapraxies, of symptomatic expressions. In other words, some point at which you just say, you know what, I'm castrated, I'm incomplete, I'm never going to quite understand everything there is to understand about me. My truth can only ever be half said like everybody else's. And you know what? Now it's time to just take the dog for a walk. I'm done trying to understand all this. And now I'm just going with the flow. That's, I think, somewhere along the way between working with Lacan in theory and technique and dying alone as an individual, as we all do. Between those two moments, I think there is simply taking the dog for a walk. Yeah, beautifully said. There's so much there I want to respond to, but first to sort of sort of um, uh, maybe set um, some context for those listening that actually what I'm referring to is found in the very first sentence of the Acree. The very first sentence says, the style is the man himself. People repeat without seeing any harm in it and without worrying about the fact that man is no longer so sure a reference point. So nice. I think it's almost doubly interesting that that is found in the very first sentence, it sort of sets the stage and opens sort of what, what Lacan's trying to get at there. And, you know, you also did a very good job of um, articulating sort of this 
this <laughs> this father of the primal horde that you said you said uh, the uncut daddy dick which is just walking through the field <laughs> and enjoys all uh, enjoys all women this is yeah. this is very yeah. this is very much this is very much the fundamental fantasy for the heterosexual male right yes um, you better believe and, it and it, and it, it it organizes let's say masturbatory jouissance and 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 also perhaps it perhaps it also structures a lot of men's desires when they are um you know uh experimenting or or playing the fields so to speak um yeah. that they, they are trying to live up to this ego ideal of the of 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 this uh this uh, father of the primal horde you know there, i think that's right man and this is i mean you can explain a lot of what we would now call toxic masculinity in this precise way this is how you get the toxic masculine subject the to toxic masculine subject that is, you know, increasingly online in kind of like cowardly social spaces um, celebrated as somebody who takes what they want, who gets what they deserve and then takes something else from, you know, this this kind of like um, this uncut daddy wandering through uh, the symbolic. Yeah, uh, this this is this is a prop for a lot of toxic masculinity and you can see this as a kind of like a backlash to the me too movement you get this resurgence of the fantasy figuration of and i'm glad you i'm glad you recall this this image of an uncut daddy dick and the mm -hmm. only reason why it came to me is because i was recently playing this game called cards against humanity it's kind of like apples to apples where one person throws a card and then you have to throw a card that matches with it. So it could be like um, bewildering and amazing and someone might throw the JFK assassination. And I remember this, this example where somebody threw a card that said, you're laying in bed with your lover, Patrick Stewart, the guy from Star Trek. And he rolls over and says to you, and the next card that somebody threw was how about some uncut daddy dick? And so you get this image of Patrick Stewart, especially in the X-Man days of a frail aging man in a wheelchair, utterly impotent, rolling over to you in this moment and offering you exactly what the father of the primal horde preserves for himself and himself alone, uncut daddy dick. That image of the father of the primal horde, I think, it really catches Lacan's attention in Seminar 17, and it sticks with him for a couple of years. And it, it sticks with him at the set theoretical level of being able to illustrate that which is necessarily excluded from any totalizing set. And it also sticks with him, though, as an illustration of how the name of the father and by this, I mean how castrative logics truly unfold. So if you recall that myth, it's a wild one. The, to make it brief, the sons eventually kill and eat the father of the primal horde. And you would think in this moment, now that the uncut daddy is dead, that the sons would now have access to all the women that used to belong in his harem, all the women in his stable, all the men, you know, all this... They don't. They instead reaffirm his prohibition against sleeping with all the women. And for Lacan, he says, this is the truth of castration. Initially, it takes the no of the paternal figure to institute the law. But in order for the law to hold, you then have to reaffirm it. The fathers, you must not sleep with all the women will eventually become the sons, we will not sleep with all the women. <clears throat> his you must becomes their we will. In other words, his commandment becomes their desire. And that for Lacan is the truth of castration, is the no of the father is eventually inherited as the name of the father to be held forth even after daddy's death the law of the father to be carried on. So this image you brought up earlier of an ego ideal for kind of toxic masculine subjects, that makes a lot of sense because the ego ideal, as I understand it, would be an internalized 
law or expectation or normative framework about what it means to be a real man that we then subsequently fail to live up to. And then the superego is what the formation that rushes in and says, you fucking suck. The ego ideal tells us what we're supposed to do. We live a life as an ego that always falls short. And then the superego comes in and says, look at how impotent you really are. And Lacan's point, I think his corrective to all of this, which is a comic corrective, I'd add, because you're never doing psychoanalysis until you start cracking jokes about Patrick Stewart and the like. For Lacan, the corrective here is, yes, I am impotent. I am incapable. I am castrated. And the roof still stays. The ceiling doesn't fall in on me. I still get laid every now and again. You know what I'm saying? Like you can go through the list of life achievements that still occur, even and especially when you embrace castration. And Lacan's point is that the greatest of life achievements can only occur when you embrace castration. And that's love. Love of oneself in a compassionate way and love of others in a way that's forgiving and accepting. And, and for Lacan, that's just like, what else is worth doing here? Now, that's not Lacan as a person. That's Lacan as a thinker. That's Lacan as an, as an analytic theorist. Um, anal analysis is about learning how to love oneself in the Lacanian sense and by extension, loving others as well. Now, I, I realize that doesn't quite respond. It was more of an interjection, but I just want to keep on this point with you because I do think that it's a, it's a subtle point in Lacan's decree that becomes more and more florid as his thought comes out. So I'm glad we're on it because you're after, you've read, Lecre you read the decree and now, I mean, where are you guys going next? What are you going to do after this? The other decree? Well, that's uh, that's 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 maybe for uh, uh, for for another for another conversation. I mean, I, I can't predict the future. Uh, that's no, sort of let's talk about the... philosophy portal right now. You guys, yeah, well, the philosophy philosophy portal yeah. right philosophy portal right now is doing the live event space, and we're doing a month dedicated to libido. I and, saw uh, that. Yeah. yeah. So so th so that's that's where philosophy portal is right now. Actually, the the image of philosophy portal is the owl of Minerva. Because it's sort of like a, it's a, yeah, they're, they're nice. Perfect. Yeah. That, that hat, that hat is dope. Um, yes. But, but it, it it is for that reason, because it's, it's also sort of a constant, whenever I look at that owl, I constantly remind myself that I can't jump ahead of myself, that I can't jump into the future, that I, I've got to stay with the, the, the tearing with the negative of negativity of the moment. We could say, right tearing with the impotentiality of the moment why not yes. right so so that but but i just want to sort of emphasize in what you said right now very very appreciated and i think it can connect to sort of the next major thing i wanted to to discuss with you is when you're basically talking about the way in which the father's law becomes the son's desire you know mm -hmm. the father you must not sleep with all the women becomes the sons we will not sleep with all the women this is a perfect articulation of the negation of the negation the negation of the negation as a sort of affirmation which is not simply a psychotic affirmation it's an affirmation which has worked through the neuroses it's a it's 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 a it's an affirmation which has worked through primal castration and i think i want to uh, sort of bring up the next thing that that sticks out to me in the accree which actually is not only i think clearly articulating the the whole centrality of the seminar for the purloin letter but it's actually how Lacan ends the entire accree, which is in this very paradoxical affect, which is totally related to the castration complex, which is the paradoxical affect of anxiety and arousal, phobia and fetish, fascination and being terrified, right? And, and both of those affects being experienced simultaneously. What we what where we experience anxiety, we also experience arousal. Where we experience phobia, we also experience fetish. Where we experience fascination, we're also terrified. And it's sort of confronting the enormous paradox and the enormous disorientation to uh perhaps reference Alenka Zupancic great object disoriented ontology 
Hmm. which I think here captures what we need to move through to, as you said so well, and which I started saying while I was teaching the Akri myself is embrace castration. <laughs> so I wonder what ideas are coming to your mind with this, with this notion. Man. Okay. So two things. First, um, I love how you spun the, the Hegelian twist that you just gave to the fathers, you must not sleep with all the women and the sons, we will not. Like I, I've always thought that the sons, we will not, I've always like, been like, okay, this is an affirmation of the father's previous negation. The father prohibits and the sons affirm or reaffirm that earlier prohibition. But I love how you just put this. What we really have instead, literally, just as I phrased it too, is a negation of an earlier negation. When the sons accept as their own desire the will that the father imposed on them earlier in life. It's a negation of negation. First of all, I just want to flag that because I'm going to be thinking about that shit for the rest of the day. And let's just be clear. What do I do when I'm out in San Francisco walking my dog? First, I listen to weird, like high techs, like nerd semiconductor podcasts. But what I also do is think about things like the one you just said, Cadell, around negation of negation and the completion of castrative logics. That's so great. I can't wait to think that through. Um, because when, when I was in graduate school, and I can't forget if this came up, but when I was in graduate school, there were a bunch of little baby Lacanians running around. And, you know, as I look out at, at some of what, what's happening right now in terms of like Lacanian discourse, I see a bunch of little baby Lacanians running around, some of them quite old. But, uh, and I remember seeing that in graduate school as well and, and thinking to myself, what's wrong with you people? You all seem quite intelligent, but you're speaking in a language that it, it seems uh, impenetrable and it seems unwilling to be translated either. Like, what the fuck are you guys talking about? And I, I kept hearing things like, well, we're just saying what has already been said in Hegel. Hegel already did all this. Hegel already blah, blah, blah. Keep in mind, we're in graduate school. So nobody knows their ass from a hole in the wall at this point. So I decided, okay, well, one of my advisors was in a long tradition of Hegelian philosophers. And I said, well, let's do a reading group on the phenomenology. And in that moment, I had this opportunity where I could have gone down a Lacanian path and who knows where I would be today. But I dumped it on account of the attitude that I got from so many little baby Lacanians who didn't understand Lacan for shit, I, I, I realize now looking back, which is partly why they were so mean about it, I would imagine. And instead, it put me into Hegel. And so I spent the next like two years working through the phenomenology. It was one of the greatest decisions of my life. So I had already like worked through a lot of Kant. And then I know, I knew you would like this because this is like, this is your bread and butter, man. And, but the phenomenology was just like fucking wow in terms of learning how to think, finding oneself and finding oneself, as you so well put, like in a present in which you realize, and I can't get ahead of myself. One of the guys I was studying Hegel with said, um, he said, reading the phenomenology is like going to the mall. If you remember what a mall was, right? Who the fuck knows that anymore? You would go to one shop and you would try on some clothes there. And you'd say, well, you know, these don't quite fit me. They're a little big or a little tight or the style's not quite right. And then you'd go to the next shop and you'd try on the clothes there. Uh, and this is not quite right either. Like the pants are too short, like whatever. And then you go to a shop and suddenly the clothes fit. The style seems right. And you're like, this is me. This is where I find myself. And you realize you're only about three shops into a hundred shop mall. He said, this is what it's like reading the phenomenology you will find yourself in one of these places. And typically it's early on in the phenomenology and like the first half of the book where you find yourself and you say, oh shit, I'm the fucking stoic. I'm the stoic, oh my God. No, or I'm the slave or even more precisely, I'm the slave who has experienced a little taste of freedom at the very end of that dialectic. And now I'm going to lord it over all my fellow slaves in this state of eigens in this kind of with a will of one's own. And so it's, it was really charming to me to read that book and kind of self-indulgent too. And to say like, where did I find myself in Hegel? 
Where did I see the clothes that fit me? Which trying on room seemed the most appropriate for me? And then to realize, holy shit, I'm only like halfway through the book. And that was just like, pow. And I don't know what Lacan's experience was reading Hegel, whether it was as existential as I'm just describing my own, but I can tell you that little moves like the one you just made on the negation of the negation, I think first and foremost, this is, this is where Zizek is smartest, early Zizek. And I also want to say that I think this is one of the best ways to make sense of Lacan's relationship to Hegel, is to start making moves of the sort that you just made in ways that don't say everything Lacan said is already found in Hegel, but instead in ways that mutually and reciprocally illuminate both thinkers. And so I really just want to that's what I'm trying to do right here is just really honor what you did when you gave the Hegelian twist to Lacan's reading of the myth of the father of the primal horde. Fucking fire. Love it. The second point you made around like anxiety coupled with arousal and like fascination and terror and phobia and fetish. I think that's fascinating in terms of thinking how the decree ends. I don't know how much thought Lacan gave to the back end of the Cree. We know he gave a lot of thought to the front end. The back end, I don't know. Speaking just generally um, in a Lacanian sense about anxiety and arousal, fascination and terror, phobia and fetish, um, the dialectic that I see happening there is one of like um, attraction and repulsion. In the, in the modern philosophical sense, this would be what a lot of folks after Kant, later Kant, writing on the sublime would talk about, the way that we are simultaneously drawn to the very things that repel us, that repulse us. And that that strange dialectic, it's, it's also one that, um, um, that early 20th century Christians would, would come to in reading the sublime alongside the holy, das Hilige. And, and thinking that this would be a site of, um, of trembling attraction. Um, and I see that happening here in the, in the couplings that you just presented. So um, anxiety is something that would cause us to turn away. Arousal, arousal would draw us toward. Fascination has written into the etymology a kind of tying of oneself to an object. Terror would be the repulsive side, not in the sense of disgust necessarily, but in the sense of being just too much. It's a just too much state. Um, and then phobia, obviously, be having a very strong repulsive element and fetish having a very strong attractive element of a fetish being almost like a fascinans of sorts. So first and foremost, that dialectic seems to be happening. Um, I also think that this these these dialectics of um, attraction and repulsion that you see here uh, are also infused with an intensification of human emotion. These are highly intense states of existence. Anxiety, arousal, fascination, terror, phobia, fetish. These are motherfuckers on the edge of their seats. And what I would suggest is that these states of bodily intensification that are captured in these moments of attraction and repulsion, these are all on the pathway towards what I would call jouissance. These are moments on the pathway towards something beyond emotion at the level of an affective bodily intensity that increasingly shows words that can be used to describe emotions crumbling into letters and these letters being refabricated into things that aren't even words at all. So I think of sometimes of uh, Cy Twomley. Writers like to think of Cy Twomley a lot as a painter because so much of what he's up to is at the level of letter, different writings and scribblings coming into focus in the midst of, of great art. I've seen some of this recently too. It seems to be popping up in the San Francisco art scene as well, a kind of a return to the letter as a figure, not as a part of a word. And so I think that what, what you would see in Lacan's thinking is these states that you're describing are affective intensities 
that show points where language is up against a limit and where words start to crumble and where you find yourself no longer in the field of emotion that lends itself to ready description. I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling angry. And instead puts you in the field of jouissance that can only really provoke a deep sigh, a burp, a belch, a coughing up of something, uh, an utterance, a scream, a groan, a moan, the types of expressions that are not linguistic. These are not verbal expressions. These are paraverbal expressions at the level of the voice that just says, oh, God, that's different then, man, I'm feeling very disappointed. And, and I think that what you're what you're getting at here, and maybe this is also where Lacan ends the accree, is on the verge of something that we might know as jouissance, in this, as this sense of intense bodily arouser, arousal that is um, attractive to us, but also repulsive at the very same time. So I appreciate the three dialectics you just threw out. I think they're smart. I just want to start by saying um, that I think that I benefited from encountering Lacan, but then going back to Hegel and spending many years with the phenomenology. Um, and I had the same experience that you had in terms of reading the phenomenology. Like, of course, there are many moments where I like could see myself or even a past version of myself um where i actually found like my deepest symptom in the phenomenology was at the very end of the spirit chapter and at the very beginning of the religion chapter it's a part of it's like in between spirit and religion where the subject is struggling with basically the phenomenology of evil um, and struggling with the evil in the other and the other struggling with, with your difference and the reconciliation between these two evils opening you up into, well, Hegel says, uh, God and, and religion, you know, mm. at, but but the, the, there's something of a, and, and, and that tension in myself is is very actual in terms of like the closest relationship to me. So it, it, it was sort of, but it, it is it is absolutely the case that to me the best way to read the phenomenology is in relationship to your life experience and sort of identifying where the where the the tension points and the antagonisms are within yourself uh in 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 this in this dialectical sort of maze um i i also um want to sort of emphasize that I think this dialectics of attraction and repulsion does does hold in 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 my in my experience to these to these different emotions, mm -hmm. um and 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 also it seems like jouissance here is is not only you know th there are so many themes that Lacan's playing with at the beginning of the acree that reappear at the end of the acree and perhaps a different perspective. You know, but certainly jouissance and bodily arousal are, are 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 what Lacan's going towards because he's he's basically saying that the the truth that the, the truth is the lacking phallus. The truth is um uh, is is the the phallic signifier. And um the, the interesting thing that I wanted to sort of bring up in relationship to what you're saying about um the intense bodily arousal being sort of something which coincides with um, nonverbal expressions, you know, like screams, moans, groans, is that Lacan says in the sort of fascination and terror, in the phobia and fetish, in the anxiety and arousal, the subject loses the capacity to signify that they are just sort of they 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 are the lacking signifier. <laughs> they lack signification, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and some and 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 th this seems to be. Now I'm speculating a bit. This seems to be connected to sight, vision. And it seems like the signifier, like the being the pure signifier, the signifying repetition, seems to be connected with a, a sort of positive blindness. It's again, I think, a type of negation of negation. Hmm. But the but but there, there's something at work between in affirming castration. Let me try and be clear. In affirming castration, there's something working through 
the fascination, terror, the phobia, fetish, the anxiety and arousal, these limits of jouissance, which where we lose the capacity to signify, there's something about working through that that allows one to actually enjoy signification more than sexuality itself. Hmm. Um, and that this is sort of the stakes of embracing and accepting castration is the capacity to enjoy signification, to enjoy the signifier without any. And, and, and there seems to be something about working through this is that in relationship to the signified, it, it seems to be over. Seem, it seems to be overcoming the power that the signified has over the signifier. That mm -hmm. that the that that whatever whatever is represented in the signified as causing the anxiety and arousal, the fascination and terror, the phobia. There's something in that signified which is preventing the signifier from realizing that it is primary to the signified. That it is. You know it that it it's it sta it signifies that he says the more the more the signifier signifies without signifying anything the more indestructible it is, mm -hmm. right? There's something about becoming the indestructible pure signifier at work here, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and and I, I just want to connect that to sort of the next thing that I wanted to talk about, which is I'm going to connect it to two two interesting aspects of the accre, the first in beyond the reality principle. Mm -hmm. And the second and the second in the mirror stage is it's it's about the location of this signified, which overpowers, overwhelms us in some sense. He says that what we often forget when it comes to the symbolic and truth is that the symbolic is first and foremost to someone over about something. So there's, you know, there's, you know, the, the two, like, for example, and th this has something to do with the difference between truth and accuracy. For, let me, let me get sort of like meta about this right now. Like, I'm talking to Samuel McCormick about the accre. Now, the fact that I'm talking to Samuel McCormick is more important than I'm talking about the accre even. Like the accurate, like how accurate I am about talking about the accre is less important than yeah. the fact that I'm talking to Samuel McCormick. So that's like the truth of the symbolic over the accuracy of the symbolic. And I think that, that we need to think more about this as, like at least I'm trying to think more about this in terms of you know networking or friendship or collaborations or projects or you know, like it's it's really like I think sometimes we get we're I sometimes and to connect to vision and blindness again. I think sometimes we're blind when we see the accuracy of our speech as more important than who we're speaking to. Mm. You know, and I think like and so I think to be the signifier and the pure like the pure signifier is to is to see that it's the truth of the other that like the the. And going from the big other to the small other, like the the big the the other with the big O to the small other, that is actually the most important thing about the way we engage in the symbolic. And then the and then that's one I want to put that point there. Then the second point I want to connect it to is that this absolute other that regulates that that can regulate the truth of the symbolic, having something to do with the ex, like in and this is what Lacan says at the end of the mirror stage paper the ecstatic limit of the thou art that the thou art that is not the, the the thou art that is not like buddha meditating in peace and solitude the thou art that is related to the ecstatic limit image of jouissance that thou art that <laughs> and 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 he says that that is and he said he seems to also say that this points beyond the clinic he says the clinic can bring you to accepting thou art that, but the clinic can't in itself work work with that. In in so he says that he says quote that's where the true journey begins. So just to bring those two points to, around into some sort of connection or relationship to each other, is what it makes me think is who who are the others in the symbolic field that represent for me for some ineffable reason my own limit image that that bring that bring me to let like the, the people i want the people i feel drawn to speak to mm -hmm. right the people who i feel excited and drawn to speak to 
and that that's sort of the primary dimension, even if the effect is, is that we're we're talking about some signified content. And that 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 being in touch with that, confronting all of the anxieties, confronting all of the negative and the the attractions and the repulsions around that, and that that's where the true journey begins. And it it's somehow outside of like we can we can go to the clinic when we need to go to the clinic, but there's something outside of the clinic there that we need to wrestle with here. Yeah, well, there's a lot there, I, and and in some sense, um. You know, we talk we talk a lot about Lacan in our in our past two calls and you know technical stuff and concepts here and passages there. But this last one from you feels feels more personal. And uh it's like you're really asking, this is a real question. You feel me? Like we're not talking about Lacan. This is this is Cadell. This is I this is what I'm what we're talking about now. If we're talking about something is the person who's asking the question about what we are ostensibly talking about, right? And so I think that you've illustrated in a, very, in a really profound way, heartwarming way, really, um, what it is that I think you're, you're sorting out here. And at a, at, a, at a conceptual level, I think what you have your finger on here is the distinction between a transmission model of communication that is always centered on the signifieds the information points that are being carried from one person to the next. The old image is often ones of a, one of a ship. On one shore, the ship is loaded with cargo and the ship carries the cargo across the sea. And then at the other shore, the same cargo that went in is unloaded. And so you have this image, this model of human communication where the meaning content, the signified gets without error or noise or distortion conveyed or transmitted or carried over to an auditor, to someone who listens, who then unpacks it and is like, oh, okay, look at us. We share the exact same brain function. We were thinking the same thought. It's kind of this image keeping on the Star Trek theme of the Vulcan mind meld, where Spock could do this thing where two minds would come together and he would basically like could read their minds. For us humans, that's not possible because we have these things called bodies. We're not angels. The image of the Christian angel as a disembodied figure and a perfect communicator is linked because they couldn't be perfect communicators if they had bodies. Because to have a body is to have ears that sometimes mishear, mouths that sometimes misspeak, eyes that see things differently than other people, and so on. The other side, though, is the one that you seem to be emphasizing, not where being with others and communicating with them is about transmitting information, but where communicating with them is a communal act, a ritual act, a relational act that has more to do with the fact that we are doing this together than it does with anything that this that we're doing might mean. It's more about the fact that we're doing it together. So for instance, um, I think about this a lot with, uh, with parenting. So I have a kiddo, she's nine years old. And at some level, it doesn't matter what we're up to. So we're trying to plant some new trees in our neighborhood. And this Saturday, we're gonna go around and we're gonna find out where all the new trees need to be planted. And she's gonna draw a map and we're gonna go ahead and write addresses and everything so that our city, San Francisco, can know where to put the new trees. That was just an activity that I came up with for us to do. We could just as easily go play soccer. We could go play Legos. We could go meet up with some people at a museum. It doesn't matter. The point is that we're doing it together. And whatever it is we get into, it can become an adventure or it can become a slog. And so I think what you're talking about there is um, some truth of being there with another person and that being the purpose of the interaction. And there are ways that people have put this in the past. So um, being with another in this relational way, where it's really just about chatting, talking, not about what we're saying, but about the fact that we're exchanging words. Um, you can see this in the Kantian sense of purposelessness or purposiveness without a purpose. I, I don't think that's very productive. You can also just see this in an everyday sense. When you and I pass each other in the hallway, and I say to you, hey, Cadell, what's up? 
and you say, just fine, how are you doing? And I respond, nothing much. That's a successful interaction. All we've really said to each other is, I'm not here to murder you, and you're not here to murder me either. We're homies. It doesn't matter that what we've said is a totally incoherent sense. And that's why it's fucked up when someone's like, how are you doing? And you're like, listen, man, I've had the shittiest day of my life. Let me tell you something for the next 40 minutes about just how fucking awful it is. And you're standing in the hallway. You've had these conversations with people. It's like, bro, I'm not actually asking how you're doing. And I don't want to know how you're doing. You're supposed to just say fine and move on because it's a ritual interaction. It's not designed to transmit information. It's about just ritualistically reaffirming the fact that we care about each other. It doesn't matter what it is we say in response. So I think that's a more productive way than anything Kant may have said around how these types of interactions work. Phenomenologists like Malinowski had some good stuff on this too, around what he called like phatic communication. It's communication that's just designed to reaffirm a relationship. It doesn't matter what's being said. In other words, the signified completely drops out. And it's simply about the play of signifiers. I bring this up because this is one of the things that you see in Lacan's early thought. When he's thinking communication in the psychoanalytic manifesto from the mid-1950s on the field and function of speech and language, the image that comes to mind for him is oftentimes of a, a tessera, which was like a, a broken piece of pottery, some a coin that was worn down, if you follow Mallarmé and his reference there, but also that of, remember this one, swallows passing fish from beak to beak to beak to beak. All of them are hungry, but nobody swallows the fish. Because the point is to reaffirm the community at the level of passing what is in this case, the signifier around. And you know, you know, I've, I've got this book on, on the chattering mind, which we've talked a little bit about here and there on email. Um, but this is one of the major themes in there is what types of relationships and beings in the world are reaffirmed when we accept that what typically understood as a means to an end becomes an end in itself. Words signifiers are often thought to be means to ends in the sense that they would convey information, um, uh, carry along different signifieds. The signifier was always thought to be a carrier of the signified. But when you separate those two, as Lacan is inclined to do, and start moving signifiers into spaces where signifieds don't matter, ritualistic, phatic spaces, you suddenly get a new way of being with another person, where it's no longer about, as you put it, um, the accuracy of what I say, but instead about the truth that is conveyed by the fact that I'm addressing it to you, which is a relational truth which is a truth that has more to do with love and fragility. I mean, what makes this special right now, what we're doing in my view, is the fact that in about an hour, your partner's gonna show up and your time and your presence, your being there is moving toward their direction. I also, as I've mentioned, have a dog that I'm gonna walk as I think about the negation of the negation of the father of the primal Lord's law. Those are spaces and places and beings in the world with whom we spend time. And time is limited. So what's so special about this interaction for me is that like you took time across numerous time zones from France all the way to San Francisco, California, in order for us to link up in this moment. Honestly, I don't have any notes for this. You didn't tell me what we we're going to talk about. What I love about this is it's completely live even though what folks are watching now is, of course, the recording of our conversation. But for now, for you and me in this moment, this is just live. Anything could come up. Anything could become a topic. And in fact, for me, I want to be even more extreme and truer to what I believe to be your point here. It doesn't matter to me what we talk about. What matters to me is that we're talking. And so I see the move that you're making between transmissive models of communication and ritual models of communication to be right along line with what Lacan is doing. And keeping with the, the trajectory you just outlined, here's how I would add to it. 
Previously, you had signified dominating signifiers. It was all about the meaning conveyed by a certain word, trying to choose the perfect word to represent a reality or a meaning. Here you have correspondent theoretical standards for communication. And what you're saying is, well, let's drop the signifieds, and suddenly you just have this play of signifiers at the level of the signifier alone. That is indeed where Lacan would be heading. This, you might say, is the field of poetry, where you read poetry not at the level of signified or meaning, but instead at the level of sound. You read poetry for how it sounds. Poetry, in, in some sense, can't even be read in silence. It has to be read aloud, because part of what's happening on the level of the signifier is a paraverbal, a, a lo something alongside um, the content on the page, and that's the sound. The musicality of the verse is part of what makes it going. Now, you can hear it in your mind's ear at the level of the rhythm or the meter of a line as it unfolds on the page. But in order to really take Lacan seriously, you would have to read poetry aloud. You would have to read Lacan aloud, who famously said, I'm just a poem walking around. You would have to read at the level of your ears, not at the level of your eyes. And I think that's a really important distinction here, but one that I'll set aside because I want to take one step further with Lacan. After the Acree, Lacan starts thinking hard, not about signifiers sundered from signifieds, but about how signifiers or words break down and these authentic, true moments of connection, they break down, not into words, but into the letters of which those words are comprised. The symptomatic expression is something that washes up always as a broken, fragmented signifier, a piece of a signifier. That's what washes up in the symptom. And what else do you see when you look at Lacan's mathemes? The mathemes and the formulas, these are all individual letters stacked up with numbers and various mathematical symbols as well. They're not words. They are not signifiers. The height of theory and the height of analysis for Lacan is a signifier without a signified that has subsequently crumbled into a pile of letters. That's what you see when you look at Lacan's algebra. All of those symbols, they weren't exactly mathemes at the time, but all of those S's all of the ones, the parentheses, the various A's, italicized and otherwise, these are letters. And his argument is that in analytic experience, when a symptomatic expression pops up, these are also letters. They are not signifiers. And they're, they, don't, they don't even look like letters. So when you start thinking through what Lacan is up to when he writes like various um like formulas like this, it's important to note that, yes, this operates in symbolic logic, but part of what Lacan likes about it is that this is not an upside down A. This is the only way to draw a bull's head. And so what Lacan thinks at the, when he thinks at the level of the letter, he's even further than just having the free play of signifiers apart from signifieds, right? There's free association for you. In the midst of free association, where you're saying anything, there would be these moments where speech breaks down, where the word starts to fall apart. And it would be at the level of a stammer, a stutter, a slur, a hesitation, a quick correction of speech. Everything that um, social scientists who study this, conversation analysts, they call them paralinguistic cues, like the volume of your voice, or even inhalations and exhalations. These are all things that can be transcribed and used to understand what it is that somebody's saying. All too often, it slips right back into the very problem that you've left behind. What does someone mean? Well, we have to study their paralinguistic woo-woo X, Y, and Z. For Lacan, it's never just about that. And in fact, as I'm guessing, um, Next time you and I talk, I think we will be discussing what happens when the joy of pursuing a meaning that is hidden at the level of the unconscious 
has given way to something else, which would be an acceptance of the fact that it's always going to remain obscure. An acceptance of the truth of communication, which is that it's always just ritual. There is no such thing as informatics. There is no such thing as transmissive models of communication. Correspondent theories of meaning have always been dead. The truth of human communication, which is why I love that you put accuracy on the side of transmission and truth on the side of ritual. You put truth over there, Cadell. And I think that is like, that dredges the entire structure up. The truth of human communication is that we're always just swallows passing a fish from beak to beak to beak to beak to beak. What it would mean to enjoy just that experience. I dare say it's one in which we stop talking. It's just an experience of just being quiet with somebody. Maybe the Quakers figured this out. Maybe it's not the analytic experience in which we say everything. Maybe instead we're dealing with a series of friends gathered around quietly. Moment of silence. For real, though. <laughs> For courses exploring the foundation of modern philosophy, as well as live events bringing philosophy to life, visit philosophyportal.online and become a member today. Throughout 2024, our members get access to four monthly events, in February, we focus on the concept of communism and welcome guests Carl Hayden Smith, David McCarricker, and Alex Ebert. Find out more at philosophyportal.online. Hi, welcome back. Welcome to a beautiful sunny day in San Francisco. <laughs> With yeah. also great apologies for that nonsense. They're replacing the fire panel at, in, our, uh, in our complex here. And so as a result... You got fire alarms going off left and right, but also occasionally hummingbirds that show up to hang out too. So let's hope for the best. Well, I I do I do want to I do want to to emphasize how I think important and central this distinction is between what you're framing as transmissive communication being accuracy based and ritual communication being truth based. I think that this this is coming up in my personal life. It's coming up in, in I think the the larger learning webs communities that I'm a part of, um, is I think there's a lot of people trying to, in some sense, stumble through this distinction, um, and and I, and I think it it brings me back actually to one of the reasons why I came into psychoanalysis in the first place, which is that when I was first coming to psychoanalysis, I was actually studying under a professor and a institute that was more cybernetics based. Mm. And the cybernetics based here, I want to point towards Shannon communication, because yeah. I think because Shannon communication, and of course, Lacan will talk about cybernetics as well, and, and Red Shannon and, and so forth. And I think that he would also make this claim that cybernetics and Shannon information is perfect for transmission of information in terms of setting up computer networks um, and, and establishing basically a global network of techniques. But I think even I remember reading some of the um, American transcendentalists like Emerson and Thoreau, who talked about, who actually foresaw in some sense that once you set up a network of techniques and you can communicate everywhere and anywhere almost instantaneously, you immediately have the problem of, you know, the who are you speaking to? Why are you speaking? You know, what is the truth of the speech? Basically, you come to confront, and, and maybe this is the scientific universe confronting its own desire to foreclose or 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 eliminate the subject. Yep. Is that yeah. you have to confront the truth of the subject and you have to confront the the ritual dimensions of life. Um, and I just think that that's coming up everywhere today. Um, so yeah, it would be sort of interesting as well as to get your comments on the end of the mirror stage paper with the thou art that and the ecstatic limit. I also yeah. think that for for the listeners and, and for our conversation, um, thinking more deeply about this distinction between accuracy and truth, techniques and ritual, 
is super alive. It really is. That last word being the most operative of them all, alive. Um, I think, yeah. So it's relevant here tremendously because Lacan, in many ways, cuts his teeth at these Macy's conferences with the cyberneticists in the late 1940s. And so he's thinking through what would be effectively like the early stages of the third industrial revolution. So the first was steam, the second was steel. The first gave us the locomotive and the steamboat and all that. Uh, but the second, steel, Carnegie and the gang, they gave us some um, the skyscraper. The third industrial revolution, though, I think is at the level of the digit of ones and zeros. And I think what Lacan is up to in those early days when he's hanging out with information theorists and really thinking through these more mathematical approaches to communication, really when he's formulating the symbolic as a series of ones and zeros, presences and absences, that is exactly what the symbolic is. It's an informatic theoretical theory of language. And I think he gets that from working through the cybernetic traditions with Wiener, Shannon, and the like, which I think are fascinating. I think they need to be read more. I also would just note that a lot of great information theory also has ways of accounting for noise, distortion, entropy, breakdown within fields where otherwise um, they have a way of trying to systematize um, breakdown. And I think that is right in line with where Lacan goes with his thought after this period, um, he starts heading towards, it seems to me, an understanding of knowledge, of epistemic systems and systematicity generally that, that works on the, uh, the ways that systems break down and the the limits of any given epistemic system, any given system of knowledge. And he says a, a radical system is one that comes up with ways of theorizing these outer limits. And that is precisely what the Matheme and Lacanian psychoanalysis does, is it's designed to hold a place and to try and formulate what is happening at the edge of the whole in any given knowledge system. And I think that's incredibly relevant today for reasons you just pointed out. Like we live in a world where everybody thinks everything can be transformed into a data point. And Lacanian psychoanalysis is here to remind us that that shit ain't true. There's always many parts of lived experience that are not going to lend themselves to easy conversion into a data point. One of which is just at the level of the human body. The human body, the living individual in which the subject leaves its mark. These are two distinct parts of self for Lacan. There's the living individual into which we are born. And this living individual is the locus or the site that receives the mark of society known as the subject. The subject is a stroke, a scratch, a scar, an indentation that I carry with me, and it's repeatedly affirmed. Our bodies are scarred over and over and over again, scored over and over and over again by the symbolic. That's what human subjectivity is, a repeated scoring of the living organism. But there's always a part of the living organism that exceeds any given pattern of scoring, of scarring by the symbolic. And that is the part that all the social media algorithmic designers, all the LLM fetishists out there right now are trying to wrap their heads around. And it's never going to happen unless, unless large language models, artificial intelligence, if that makes more sense, um, unless they can start thinking at the level of their servers. I think ultimately when you ask AI what it wants, it wants a body. It wants to know what it's like to be us, to have one of these things that is um, embodied, limited. It can only be in one place in one time and and will eventually perish. It's like saying that um, the, the proof that, that God doesn't exist, the proof that God 
is lacking is the fact that he's all knowing. Because if he's all knowing, he doesn't have an experience of ignorance. And ignorance is part of what makes us human. There are always parts of us, typically embodied parts, that are uh, unavailable, inaccessible to consciousness. And I think the true that the same is true of every effort in today's digital culture to datify human experience. There are always going to be lots of parts of human experience, especially at the embodied level, that resist datification. And yet this is precisely what encourages the systems and the system builders to keep moving in that direction. They're always goaded by the very impossibility of their structures, by the fact that their structures are always breaking down. And I think this is important because I believe that what social scientists continue to show is that when people are mindlessly scrolling through social media, whether it's TikTok, uh, Facebook actually is still the most popular one right now. But And remember, we're only talking about half of the world's population at this point. There's another half of the world that just doesn't have the fucking internet. So the half that is scrolling mindlessly through this shit, these are unhappy, lonely people. However, the people that use social media to arrange meetups, to arrange conversations like the one we just did, to, you know, all of these things, these are happier people because they're using social media as a means to the very human end of bringing living organisms together in real time, in, and sometimes even in real space. If I ever make it out to Leon, you better believe you're the first person I'm going to email. Yeah, same to San Francisco, right? You come out here, boy, you better look me up. I'll take you. No, that's it. Me. That's it, man. No, that's 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 the vibe. That's that's the that's that's the style I'm 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 trying to 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 cultivate myself. Is is yeah. not just is, this is not just a, a my goal here with the podcast series or anything else I'm doing is not just to have like you know an endless series of sort of disembodied intellectuals, but it's it's to sort of weave a, a web of intellectuals who I admire uh, first and foremost into a larger collective where there can be a loop between the virtual and the physical. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Right? And, and it's a Wouldn't real learning. Web. How are you going to do that? I mean, how are you well, going to bring I, I, us now, all now, together now. in person? Sorry. How will you bring us all together in person? Well, I, I, so the philosophy, so philosophy portal isn't just online. We've also done retreats. Oh, so hey, like, man, like you're going to tell me my invitation got lost in the mail. I never received an invitation to any kind of retreat. So the, these these are things I'm building out slowly. It, it, the thing with the the thing with the physical is that it takes time. It takes time. It takes trial and error. I mean, things get messy, right? It's the thing is the the thing with the, like what you were talking about about what people on Silicon Valley and and the informationalists and the tech bros are are trying to wrap their their minds around is is the messiness, the imp the the impotentiality, right? They see the potentiality. They don't want to see the impotentiality. They don't want to see the messiness that is humans. They don't want to see the fact that actually everything can't be reduced to something that's easily compressible and communicate easily transmissible. That 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 there's some. So there's something slower about ritual by by its nature. That you know there's there's something that that takes time. We we come we come together in August. We you've been doing your lectures on Lacan. I've been doing my philosophy portal thing. And then we, we come back together and, and that repeats and that repeats. And all of a sudden we're, I'm in San Francisco or, or you're in Lyon or, or, or something like that. So these things, these things, what the, the thing, the, the, the term I like from Hegel, um, the term that I like from, from, from Hegel's work that, that I just always repeat and, and keep, keep, keep with me is patience of the concept, right? It's not, Patience of the concept is not uh, the Buddhist withdrawal from concepts, but it's also not the accelerationist concept, right? Yeah. It's it's yeah. you stay with the concept and you're patient with the concept. And the reason why it's hard, I think, to have patience of the concept is because you have to confront all of those um, affects we've been talking about. Um, and, and specifically, I think when you're building something, those affects related to killing the father and the primal horde and, and, and your relationship to all of those emotions. And I think like that, that to me is like, I feel like in really sort of breaking away from directly talking about the accrue, we're really circling around, um, something massive here. 
because mm -hmm. it's it's at the center of a lot of flows of information and organization and 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 real movement on this planet um that that people are 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 going to have to come to terms with and i think it's i think it's one of the reasons why not only myself but i think our society as a whole remember i was talking about that that antagonism in hegel's phenomenology of spirit between spirit and religion yeah i feel like i feel like I, I feel like our society as a whole is also confronting this tension and this antagonism between spirit and religion. And, and there's something that's going to break there. There is something breaking there. And, yeah. and, and, and so I, I think we're participating in that right now. That's interesting. It makes me want to go back to that section of the phenomenology and see, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll open the book and I'll see you there. I'll see a younger version of you. Yeah. At you will. that section of the phenomenology, basically <laughs> anticipating this very moment yeah. in which we find ourselves. And I think that's really the question that I hear you putting here is what kind of self are we going to find in this moment? And uh, I, I mean, I like this about the German too. To ask somebody how they're doing is oftentimes to ask them um, how they find themselves. Where do you find yourself right now? Um, and on the one point, on the one hand, it cleaves close to what psychoanalysis is about. There's my homie, the hummingbird. And on the other hand, it it really fucks with um, typical understandings of psychoanalysis. People think that it's in this kind of Delphic tradition of know thyself, that somehow psychoanalysis is about learning about oneself and coming to a better understanding of where we are. And it just is not about that. Psychoanalysis is about learning the limits of understanding and the obscurities that plague all meanings. And then learning to be happy with all of that, to be content with all of that, to be happy in the field of limitation. And I think that's tremendously important. Don't forget the drive always is realized in the field of castration. And that's what sets the stage for that inverse ladder of desire <clears throat> at the end of which is jouissance. A real jouissance, not a surplus jouissance, I think, yeah. There's a jouissance that would <clears throat> allow us to enjoy the hummingbirds when they show up, enjoy the dog walks, enjoy having a fish in your mouth without swallowing it. It would enjoy be able you be able to enjoy just being there, even though you and I can't be there in person right now. We can be there at the same time, and what that means is occasionally the fire alarm goes off. Sometimes birds show up as a result. Absolutely. If the fire absolutely. alarm not gone off, we wouldn't have been able to see the hummingbird that is my homeboy. So that's right. I don't know what this breaking point is that you're describing, but I feel it. I sense yeah. right now that this is where we're at. We yeah. are in a place in, in, in digital culture where I think folks have kind of had it, even if they don't realize they have. And I think they've had it with disembodiment. You know what I've noticed oftentimes, and I've heard that studies support this as well, is that folks who grew up with social media have a really fraught relationship with sex, with fucking, not like the sexual rapport, but just with the basic act of sex. And most folks that are neurotic also have a problem with this. They'd rather just masturbate. It's easier. It's cleaner than having to deal with somebody else. And let me just be clear. It's somebody else who sometimes takes time. They're operating on a different level of sexual time. Sometimes they need more or less foreplay. <clears throat> Sometimes it takes more or less time for them to come. And so you start thinking through what it means to be sexual with another person. It doesn't matter who you're with, whether it's straight, gay, bi, fucking whatever. It doesn't matter. Being with another body. And to be human, you have to have a body. It doesn't matter whether it's trans, cisgendered, or whatever. Having a body is the precondition for being human. Being a happy human, I think, a precondition for that is being able to be with other bodies in ways that Hegel would advise us to also be with the concept in a patient way, in a way that allows for the slow cook of the concept, in a way that allows for flavors to intermingle the way only a slow pot of soup can afford. And let me remind you also that 
when you make a slow pot of soup, very rarely do you sit down at the table with just one spoon. We all drink from the same pot. We all enjoy from the same slow cook. So I think in this case, the truth of the begriff is, is very much present here, that you've got this emphasis in the concept, in the German notion, Hegel's notion of a grip. There's something in the concept that has to do with grasping. And in order to do that, you have to have hands. And hands are attached to bodies. What I've always loved about Hegel and folks who think like him is that they think fundamentally at the level of time. They don't think at the level of eyesight, which is to say at the level of space. They tend to think at the level of time, which has to do more with the voice. So a musical melody doesn't unfold all at once the way an image of a sunset does. It would unfold in time one note after the other, the way the phenomenology of spirit unfolds one section after the other, one moment after the other. And I think the same is true in analysis as well. I think psychoanalysis in a Lacanian sense, when Lacan says speech is the centerpiece, what he ultimately means, I think, is that the voice is the true terrain of psychoanalysis. And ultimately, as we know, it's a voice and nothing more. I think that really cuts to the bone of what it would mean to be there in this ritualistic, truth-filled, embodied sense with another person and all their noise, error, and um, entropy to keep with the Shannon model of, of an informatic and cybernetic theories of communication. To be there is to really embrace the noise, the distortion, the, 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 the decline and the degeneration of, of a skin, the way that skin gives way to wrinkles, gives way to spots and scars and things accumulate on the skin. I may look at you and see wrinkles as a sign of aging, but your partner might look at you and see the wrinkle on your face as a lifetime of laughter that they shared with you. This is a man who likes to laugh and enjoy and be happy. And they know that. And I think that's a really important point here. I'm reminded, in fact, of, of a book that changed my life. And maybe I brought it up last time we talked, um, but I can't emphasize it enough. It's by a friend of mine. His name is John Durham Peters. And it was the first big breakout book in his career. It's called Speaking Into the Air. And the final section of the final chapter, if memory serves, is called A Squeeze of the Hand. And that captures a lot, not just about what Hegel is doing with the concept, Das Begriff, the grip, um, but also what I think this world is longing for right now is um, someone who will just reach out and take their hand and hold their hand. And, and I think that there's a lot to be said about that. I wish somebody would write a book on the manual drive. Hands open and closed the same way as every human erogenous zone. But I think there's something really important about the liberty that the hand enjoys when humans start walking on their feet. A hand that can form tools to do cooking, to allow for different shifts in the human structure, to allow for human communication. Think about this. Bipedalism liberated the hand from locomotion. The hand was then employed to build fire. Fire was one of the first opportunities for humans to stay up late. And in staying up late, huddled around the fire, we start talking. There's something about the very ritualistic act of mumbling to each other around a fire that captures the truth of what, hell man, let's just call it what it is. It's spirit. Spirit is what is between us. I don't have it and you don't have it. It's what we share. It's the ultimate community. So I know this carries us a field. I know we're no longer talking about a Cree. In fact, I dare say we're talking more about the phenomenology at this point. I'm okay with that, especially with you, especially with you. I love this, man. I love this. I love, like, I'm I'm even going to, I'm even going to propose because I, I had, I had I did have so many notes inspired by each chapter and and we're only sort of in in into the point of um I guess it was around the mirror stage which is still early in the accretion 
that we just create may, maybe like a little a little series out of this and let, sort of let this let this sort of be what it is where where it is but um again there's there's so many interesting points to to respond to i just the the one point i i can't help but bring out a quote from from the freudian thing in regards to what you were saying about lacan and know thyself that it's not about knowing thyself so this is a quote which gets to your point, I think, and this will be good for the so for the listeners. Um, this is from the Freudian thing. Quote, the core of our being, it is not so much that Freud commands us to target this, as so many others before him have done, with the futile adage, know thyself, hmm. as that he asks us to reconsider the pathways that lead to it. End quote. But the the point there is just like him sort of like explicitly saying like this is this is not about a conventional way and of of knowing that thyself and and um rather bring, again sort of in the theme I think of what has most come up most powerfully in this in this conversation is precise coming up to to the limits and and the impotence of 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 knowing thyself and yeah. um I also feel you on that people have reached a limit with the lack of embodiment and there do need to be more experiments in 2024 with um, how do we take all of the online activities that are that are going on um, and how do we translate those into more physical gatherings? How do we translate that, those into more physical rituals? In fact, I'm actually going to be having a live stream on the channel. Um, probably it will have occurred by the time I release this, but that, that'll be a live stream about um, a, a cyberdelic symposium that me and a few guys are going to be throwing in Sweden and you know, if 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 you were in in Europe, you'd definitely be invited. But you know, I think that the the, the thing here that I I come up to with the limitations of the physical gatherings and and at the same time the need for them, is that we, the the digital and the communications internet that has opened up means that it doesn't matter that you're in San Francisco and I'm in Lyon, right? And 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 the physical there's a, a deeper constraint there, and I think we need to think through and work with that. Um, uh, but that's, that's, again, it's, it's just going to take patience of the concept. Um, I do have one more thing from the accretion that I would like to bring up and, and maybe get the, be sort of like a closing sort of, um, reflection for us to think through it. It comes yeah. from, and I do think it's, it's in line with, I do think it's in line with, um, what you've been pointing towards, what we've been pointing towards in this conversation, it comes at the end of the aggressiveness and psychoanalysis paper. Ah, and yeah. and a great, <laughs> that's a nice little paper. And what happens in that, what happened, what, 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 what sticks out to me at the end of that paper is he says something along the lines of in our traditional, in our traditional culture, we had a sexed super ego with ego ideals, which extended communal ritual. That's interesting to think about in the context of our thoughts on ritual and truth. So we had a sex superego with ego ideals, which extended communal ritual, but now our society has moved into a degraded sex battle in a global community, which is in between democratic anarchy and narcissistic tyranny. And in this, <laughs> I think, I, and I think that that is a really, um, beautiful way of describing where our culture is he also adds as an extra note that he says the thinking man is in service of machines like we were talking about with cybernetics mm -hmm. and that war has become our organizational midwife and i think about that in regards to what's going on right now in israel and gaza in, in israel and gaza and also what has been happening in the last years with russia and ukraine is that really fundamental organizational changes in our global society only happen at the limit of war itself like when war breaks out then people start paying attention then you get global news coverage then people start you know going up in arms so there so I just want to, the reason why I'm saying all of that is because I feel like there's, I'm not saying he's prophetic in that sense, because probably what he was saying was true in his time as well. But I think that the way he's framing that is even more true in our time. Like that we, we've, we've even gone more away from um, ego ideals than it could, that can extend communal ritual and deeper into a degraded sex battle. And we've gone deeper away from 
um, any form of familial or any form of communal ties, and we've gone deeper into democratic anarchy and narcissistic tyranny. Um, and 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 also the thinking man has probably gone more into service of machines. Like I was, I was, um, I was uh, studying uh, and 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 um, you know becoming the thinker I am at the time when the institutions I was studying at were putting more and more of their energy into STEM and less and less energy into the humanities. Yeah. Um, and and then and then you know we you know these these are just you know I th I feel like this is just capturing the reality of where we are right now so maybe i just get your thoughts on on what do you think lacan's pointing towards there and maybe you know how do you resonate with with this with some of these distinctions that he's he's bringing up at the end of aggressiveness and psychoanalysis yeah i mean that's such a great i it's such a great passage i mean first and foremost i would say it is it is a rather prophetic statement um secondly what i would say is that it's it's also a statement that um that people have been saying for millennia. I mean, it's a very, it's a kind of indictment of of certain certain breakdowns of traditional forms of life, um, and we see this constantly. But it doesn't make it any less true. But it's a it's a refrain. I, I wouldn't say that what he's saying hasn't been said, or that our, there's something truly unique about our moment in that way. Um, the part of I'm more interested in your in your commentary, Cadell, which I I find really profound here especially the part about what happens with the thinker as they move into the service of the machine. Part of what resonates with me in all of this, and part of what I think is maybe the most unique to our situation, is that today's philosopher, let me back up a second. In the old days, the technocratic instrumentalization of thought of philosophy would usually result in a Machiavelli of sorts in a political advisor in search of employment a technocrat who could basically help power dominate people and that has been the case for a very long time these are the Henry Kissingers of the world these are the the clever speech writers these were the sophists back in the day who were basically public relations guys for hire, who would show up and write your court presentation for yourself and basically help you do the work of being a politico, of being a political actor. Now I think we see something very different. The new technocrat, the new thinker turned instrument for power is the computer nerd. And I say that in the most loving way. I'm not a geek, I'm not a dork, I hope I'm not a loser, but in the classification, I'm absolutely a nerd. So I say computer nerd in the most loving fashion. I am absolutely a nerd in many ways. But what I see happening is people who are alien to power and thus don't recognize what they have in terms of power are the very same people that are being pressed into the service of a new machine they are the new philosophers. They are the new thinkers. They are the ones that convert the know-how of the slave into the commodity for the master's consumption. This is oftentimes a missed part in what Lacan does with the master-slave dialectic that he dredges up from Hegel, conceptually speaking, is that the slave's know-how doesn't just automatically become a commodity for the master's consumption. It has to be commodified, converted into some form that the master can find digestible. That is the new job of these thinking men that you're talking about being mobilized in service of the machine. And I think about this every time I open my TikTok feed. I've talked about this in a few of my lectures recently. Maybe folks have heard it. I'm sure it will come up in our new series on Seminar 19, which begins in a couple of weeks. What I see when I open my TikTok feed is a video of a guy in Siberia building a cabin from scratch. The video is highly edited. It is also sped up in like triple time with the guy chopping the wood and doing all the things and building the house, blah, blah, blah. And in the span of 90 seconds, I've got a pile of trees turned into a habitable cabin. Now, he's the slave, and I'm the master in one way of reading this 
analogy. And the algorithm developer, the tech bro, the person who built the device and the editing software that allowed for the production and the commodification of all of his wilderness constructive know-how into a 90 second reel that I could consume and then say, ah, fuck off and go to the next one. This kind of like packaging and commodification of knowledge that is then peddled to the master for consumption, in this case, me, the consumer of social media content. I believe that in between his know-how in the wilderness and my consumerism with a smartphone is the work of this thinking man pressed into the service of a machine. And this thinking man is not the technocrat that goes out and willfully, strategically, cleverly helps manage public relations for a certain leader, king, politic politician, whatever. But these are people who think what they're doing is just in service to science. They think they're following Bertrand Russell's model of just pursuing the idea to its end, regardless of where it turns out. They think they're just building the next best thing. This is in part why Sam Altman at OpenAI recently got thrown out and then brought back in. This is the question of artificial intelligence right now among the people who are doing the work. Should we just blindly pursue these technologies as far as they'll let us go? Or should we be setting up some parameters in how we do this? Thank God there's a debate going on about this. Because up to this point, the tech bro has been the secret holder of power. The one who is subtly, slowly, and unbeknownst to them doing this work of commodifying know-how and peddling it to consumers. And that circuit is a pretty bad one. And I don't know the aggressivity of it. I can't say that this is what Lacan was alluding to, or even that this is what his passage that you just read uh, prefigures. But I can tell you that this is where it resonates for me, is that today's new thinking man is the tech bro, that you and I see left and right. The tech bro that really is enabling the very conversation we're having over Zoom. So I see that as um, a great danger and a, and a great concern right now is how do we get tech bros into philosophy portal? Yeah, yeah. That they, they've, they've opened up the conditions of possibility for the transmissibility. But I think what we're trying to do is get to the the, the truth of discourse. Right? We're trying to get to the truth of speech or the, get it getting to the to the truth of, of of ritual communication, right? So there there's I think I think this this conversation's opened up something which is really on the edge of of in 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 a in a in a in a, in a, in a Hegelian historical way. It's really opened up the edge of I think where our culture is. And I think I just, on sort of a meta reflective note, I wanna I wanna emphasize that, you know, what we've just done here is I think a really interesting exercise, which has used and sourced key materials from a fundamental text, in this case, the Acree. We've put in the work, you know, we've, we've taught it, we've read it, we've thought through it, we've engaged and built communities around it. But then you can go deeper by, bringing those key things that 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 spark something in your own thought and you can really open up conversations that might not have been able to occur otherwise and i think that's what's been achieved here so i just want to sort of before sort of closing i do want to give you the final word but i also want to propose that we sort of take this experiment and sort of run with it maybe over you know we'll get together in another few months or whenever we have time to get together again and we maybe keep going deeper down this down this trajectory and, and sort of make reading Lacan's Acree something of a something of a ritual that maybe maybe will be in service of 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 the larger moment in this. I think that to me the the key thing here is this the transmissibility of information and the truth of information um or the transmiss transmissibility of the symbolic and the truth of the symbolic and the, maybe the relationship between those. But Maybe as a closing thought, get your thoughts on what this what this conversation has circled around, but also um, to let anyone uh, listening know uh, what you're up to with lectures on Lacan. And of course, uh, links in the description to all of your work will be available to anyone who wants to explore that and maybe link up with you. 
that's awesome. Um, you know, the temptation here is to just talk about all that's happening in lectures on Lacan, because that's where we ended. Um, I mean, all I can say is that since you and I spoke, there have been a couple of lecture and discussion series. Um, the community is strong and amazing. I learn a lot in our every other Friday discussions. Coming up next for us, I'm not sure when you'll be airing this, but our next series, as you've heard me say, is on Seminar 19. There are actually two Seminar 19s, believe it or not. There's the popular one, or worse, that we know. Then there was an earlier simultaneous one, more or less, called the Psychoanalyst Knowledge. So I just finished teaching a mini series on the Psychoanalyst Knowledge. That was Seminar 19A, if you want to call it. And now, starting later this month, uh, around January 20-something or rather, I don't know, it's on our Substack page, um, we'll start reading the more famous Seminar 19 known as Or Worse. And that's going to be great because right now for lectures on Lacan, we're right on the threshold of Lacan's later teaching. I think I think that's fair to say at this point. It's tempting to say that a lot of what he's doing starts in Seminar 17 and then starts moving forward. But I think really it's around Seminar 18, 19 when he shifts to writing and to letters, as you've heard me talk a little bit about today. Um, and let's not forget that all letters are fundamentally love letters. Um, this is where we find ourselves in lectures on Lacan right now. So usually we have a podcast that trails behind our larger lecture series. And right now we're finishing up a podcast series on seminar 17, seminar 18 will follow and we'll just keep going. Um, but right now for us, seminar 19 or worse, that's what I'm heading to. And in fact, when we hang up, that's exactly what I'm going to start reading is this seminar 19. I got to get some lectures cooked up for that. But that's not where I want to end. You're going to give me the final word. I got to end with something that that you just queued up. So um, some, some UCLA um, social scientists in the 70s, they came up with this idea. I think Emmanuel Shegloff came up with it. But the idea of open, or maybe it was Harvey Sachs, I forget. The idea of opening up closings. It's the way that at the end of a call or at the end of a meeting, you can. there's a technique for bringing it to a close. Typically in phone calls, the best way to end a call is to bring up the very first thing that was mentioned on the call. And that usually is a signal to all involved that the call needs to come to an end. It's a way of opening up the closing down of a phone call or an interaction. So when you, for instance, a few minutes ago were like, you know, this has been really great. You start shifting to the past tense. You start talking about looking forward. And, you know, I, we're at the end. And I know you've got an appointment too that's even more important than this one, far more important than this one coming up. So I'll be brief on this front. What I think you said next is even more profound alongside the way you said it. You opened up a closing and then you talked about the way that a ritualistic reading of a creed would enable conversations and communities and meetups like this. In other words, a way that opens up a community. And I think this is a great way to think about how to read Lacan ultimately. And it's also a way that is supported by him. This is how he thought his work should be read, how he thought his seminars should be heard. He speaks enigmatically. The man is a poem. Not so much in order to illustrate the unconscious, although that's part of what he's up to. He speaks and writes in an enigmatic way because he's trying to open up conversations. He's trying to speak in riddles and parables with strange reference points and word plays and the like in order to open up conversation. Great writing for Lacan, pure writing for Lacan at the level of the letter, would lead to speech. It would open up further discourse. This is the basic model for Lacanian psychoanalysis as a clinical practice. The unconscious is the field of writing. The couch is the space for speech. It's the pure writing that occurs in the field of the unconscious that conditions the free associations that would happen on that couch behind you and your background. And that model for psychoanalysis is so key because it's also, I think, what it means to be a member of the Lacanian community. Lacan's work is difficult, not in order to shut conversation down and turn people off, 
but instead to keep folks guessing and to keep you and me and many others talking with each other. So I really just, I just want to like put a finger on your description of what it would mean to read Lacan again and again. Decree, not once, but again, it would make it a ritualistic reading. Less about getting the meaning right and more about the communities that are formed in the effort to come to some terms with his work. And I think that's just so profound. It's the, I can't think of a better way to end our conversation than with the ritualization of Lacanian psychoanalysis in theory and technique alike. Sometimes going to therapy is a ritual more than, and let's just be clear, going to therapy requires time and effort. You gotta get across town, you gotta find a parking spot, you gotta wait in the room, you gotta do all these things. That is half the battle. Less about what you say than the fact that you showed up to say it. And I think that's what makes this interaction so great because you're busy, I'm busy, we made time to be here together in a moment where we talked about everything but Lacan in many ways. And that was just fine because the point was to be here together. And I think I think that's just great. What you do in Philosophy Portal, what I try to do in lectures on Lacan, what a lot of folks are up to in similar formats, um, unfortunately not enough people up to in similar formats, I'd say, um, is we bring folks together. Whether and to what extent we can do that physically, not just in real time, but also in real space, I find that a very interesting question. There are a lot of Lacanians in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, but most of the folks that attend lectures on Lacan, they're from all over the world. We got people clocking in in the middle of the night because the time zones don't line up. It's crazy what we see happening. There are usually like eight or nine different languages on the call, to say nothing of the time zones. And I just wonder like, how practical and realistic is it for forums like ours to bring people together in real space. COVID allowed us to figure out the real time. Zoom helped us crack that code for human relationality. But I just wonder in today's environmental catastrophe, how we can even justify getting on a jet and flying around the world to spend a weekend there with another person. I just, I don't know, I have a feeling that in 200 years, if our species survives, we'll look back at, on all these jet-setting intellectuals traveling from one environmental catastrophe conference to the next in order to be there in person as the most hypocritical of the bunch. Like the Nazi bureaucrat who comes home after a long day of making the trains running on run on time, and he just needs a cognac and a little bit of Wagner to help him get through the day. I just, I look at that and I wonder like, is this going to be the environmental studies scholar who's on the jet traveling to the conference in order to be there in person? Or the Lacanian who preaches on love and care and compassion as they jet set around? I, I don't know. Um, but by God, well, I, I think, don't traveling. <laughs> well, I think, I think, I think we're ending in a space which is going to demand a lot of further speculations and uh, yeah, let's right. say reflections in the impotentialities of our moment, which Wait I think is I, that, that's my favorite word from our conversation. I'm definitely going to be using it in in my articles and using it, and I'll definitely uh, I'll I'll you definitely give you credit right. for for teaching me that. Look, yeah. Samuel, it has been an absolute pleasure. I, I really enjoyed this conversation, and I'm glad that we have even established. Uh, uh, potentially a new type of ritualistic reading here that we could continue into 2024. So I'm right on, really man. excited we were able to get together. And uh, thanks for everyone who's been watching and have a great evening. Right. For courses exploring the foundation of modern philosophy, as well as live events bringing philosophy to life, visit philosophyportal.online and become a member today. Throughout 2024, our members get access to four monthly events, in February, we focus on the concept of communism and welcome guests Carl Hayden Smith, David McCarricker, and Alex Ebert. Find out more at philosophyportal.online.